So, the, uh, the first of our specific environmental examples, heat stress. We will uh, complement this with cold stress uh, shortly. We'll have about two weeks talking about the specific effects of heat stress. There's primary and secondary effects. And a nice spin-off of this topic is, uh, is dehydration, how dehydration results from heat stress and what it means, and what the implications are for continued exercise, which is where uh, I did a lot of my doctoral work. So it's nice to revisit that stuff uh, time and time again. So heat stress. <laughs> Exercise in a hot environment or just really hard exercise will invoke some kind of heat stress. What we're going to do in this chapter is take a look at uh, what exposure means. We allow some variation in body temperature, and that's fine. We're not concerned with it, but if that variation is too high, too much, too large, then we care. And we care largely because it affects our ability to perform. Uh, as, as uh, participants in sport or even uh, job tasks. So there's a, there's a wide range of different ways that we can describe heat stress or the, uh, the illness associated with heat. We'll look at that in the exposure section. Uh, we'll look at some practical methods for sensing temperature. Morning. So sensing temperature. Right now, we know what's hot or cold, we talked about what heat is, but from the body's physiological point of view, what temperature is important, and how would we measure it from the outside looking in? How would we measure temperature from the outside looking in? You often think back to the under-the-tongue thermometer when you were a kid and you were sick which I might have to do soon, but there are more scientific ways to measure temperature in different areas. Uh, using that information, we'll look at specific effects. So if you become hot, what happens at the muscle? What happens to the cardiovascular system? What are the physiological responses to exercise? And how do those allow us to continue exercise? third major point. Um, I got ahead of myself. The first is, does body temperature increase and how does it increase? How do we characterize the increase? Then how do we respond to prevent the increase from being excessive? There are physical uh, things that we can measure, but some intangible aspects as well. The psychological burden of heat is something that's um, more recently coming to the forefront of, of the research field. Heat may simply impair performance, even at low levels, because it feels harder. The work feels harder. You're less motivated. And that's a really difficult area uh, to study and, and to measure. Lastly, we'll talk about modifying heat tolerance. And in the set of notes that I put on Moodle, this section is, is fairly brief. I think what I would like to do is bolster this a little bit and add a little bit more detail about types of protocols for heat acclimation, how you can force someone to uh, tolerate the heat better, to perform better in, in under future heat stress. And there's some really interesting uh, new research in the last two or three years on the subject of cross-adaptation. And what cross-adaptation means is if you train in the heat, if you become more tolerant of the heat, there are these unexpected secondary effects for stress like altitude. You become better at uh, dealing with high altitudes. You're not altitude training, but this uh, adaptation specifically to heat confers some secondary benefits to um, maintaining performance at altitude. Somewhat unexpected, so I'll see if I can bolster this and then add that tie-in, which we'll come back to later when we get to that section. So heat stress. I like throwing this figure up. Um, it's an XKCD comment from a couple of years ago to provide perspective and maybe drum up a bit of enthusiasm for studying heat as a field because it doesn't seem 
like it's going away, and if anything, heat will be more prevalent as we move through our, uh, our, uh, the next few years. And this is simply their attempts to trace world temperature over time, starting from that 20,000 BC. And I've cut out a lot of the figure because on the web page, you literally scroll, I think you page down 15 times to get between this top uh, half of the chart and then down here. And this is what we're used to. This is present day. And these are the potential branches for uh, Earth's temperature as, as we spread out and realize something has to be done to be able to limit this. But certainly heat stress, if this continues, will be a large concern for athletes, occupational workers, the general population, people living near the equator, um, and on upwards if it continues to worsen. So heat stress coming up. In our, uh, in our recent history, it's never been as much of a problem as it will be in the next 5, 10 years. So understanding what we're going to talk about in this section and some of the, uh, the, the ways that we can mitigate heat stress might be important. So how does the environment explore, uh, exploit normal function? So we have already identified that we want to regulate our body temperature at 37 degrees. But it doesn't stay at 37 degrees if you exercise. If you exercise, if you're in the heat and exercising, we get variation in this temperature. We allow the body to warm up. Why? If this were such a concern, why even allow the body to warm up? Certainly there must be some benefit. Nature is the great experimenter as we've evolved. Uh, evolved. If something was not um, favorable, it would be selected out. Why do we allow this core temperature to increase with exercise or in response to the environment? There's no answer to that right now. Uh, we'll go through some of the physiological changes and then I'll come back and ask you this at the end. But there's no answer yet. Just keep that in mind. The things that would allow that to change or force that to change are all of those elements we talked about in the heat balance equation. Some imbalance occurs. Does that imbalance occur for a reason to allow core temperature to increase? Maybe. Body temperature continues to rise if there is a persistent imbalance in the heat balance equation. So as we move to exercise, there is... Uh, some imbalance. One or two factors drive the increase in heat storage. But we would like to enter into balance at some point. We like to um, stabilize as exercise progresses. And in a lot of cases, that happens. In some cases, that doesn't happen. And those are listed here. So if there's a larger than normal metabolic heat generation, or if... Um, your normal heat loss mechanisms are compromised. You can't convect and conduct to the air because you're wearing really dense equipment, protective equipment. If you're in an inhospitable environment with a really high relative humidity that limits evaporation. If these things sabotage our ability to stabilize the heat balance equation, we will continue to see an increase in core temperature. Let's, um, let's assume, I think, for the uh, majority of our discussion that we're in the heat and we are able to stabilize. Um, a brief video coming up that will, will help differentiate those two. Now, for the most part, any environment that we encounter will be reasonable. Even Nova Scotia in the summer being very humid, uh, going out to exercise in the heat, we might cut our run short. Um, but... Even still, core temperature doesn't increase so much. We don't often run into these situations where the environment is unreasonable, such as the, uh, um, the Badwater Marathon that I presented almost on the first day of class, which the finishing time for that, the best finishing time, is 39 hours, by the way, which, think about that, 39 hours. You're not racing. This is like a... Race of attrition. It's can you finish? 39 hours in these extreme, unreasonable situations. 
Um, so for the most of us, the most part, we're not at risk. Our recreational selves are not at risk, but the individuals that are at risk of what we'll call heat illness, which is a broad spectrum of diseases that we'll talk about shortly, are not us, I suppose. They are ultra-endurance athletes. Maybe there are some of those among you in the group. Certainly not me. Uh, elite individuals or recreational athletes that get themselves into a situation that they're not used to. Recreational athletes under normal circumstances, not generally at risk, but in uh, higher than average temperatures or relative <clears throat> humidities, they can be at risk. Um, larger than normal uh, stress in training, practice. Factory workers, firefighters, older adults, almost always at risk, especially in the summer, they have a reduced capacity to thermoregulate. We'll talk about that in the, uh, in the dehydration section a little bit. This is of uh, larger importance now from a public health point of view. Remember when I lived in Toronto a few years ago, they had a um, cooling station all, always set up, um, water, ice water, mist spray. And we're always avidly trying to recruit older adults to come in, into the AC, out of the heat uh, during the summer months. And then summer months, living near the equator, especially as uh, the temperature of the earth continues to rise. So I'm going to introduce this idea of heat stress and heat illness in a small video, which we'll expand upon uh, afterwards. This introduces the idea of risk, the types of people or situations that characterize that risk, and then we'll um, define a few of those elements a bit better afterwards. Short four-minute video. ran the championship 10,000 meter track race at the Empire State Games. Suddenly, with just 200 meters to go, he collapsed, got back up, and then collapsed again on the final straightaway, with his body temperature at dangerous levels. He had suffered an exertional heat stroke. Fortunately, with immediate and proper treatment, he survived the potentially fatal episode, and has since helped save 167 people in similar circumstances. From ancient soldiers on the battlefield to modern-day warriors on the gridiron, exertional heat stroke, or sunstroke, has long been a serious concern. And unlike classical heat stroke, which affects vulnerable people such as infants and the elderly during heat waves, exertional heat stroke is caused by intense exercise in the heat and is one of the top three killers of athletes and soldiers in training. When you exercise, nearly 80% of the energy you use is transformed into heat, in normal circumstances, this is what's known as compensable heat stress, and your body can dissipate the heat as quickly as it's generated through cooling methods like the evaporation of sweat. But with uncompensable heat stress, your body is unable to lose enough heat due to overexertion or high temperatures and humidity, which raises your core temperature beyond normal levels. This causes the proteins in cell membranes to denature, creating cells that no longer function properly and begin to leak their contents. If these leaky cells proliferate through the body, the results can be devastating, including liver damage, blood clot formation in the kidneys, damage to the gastrointestinal tract, and even the failure of vital organs. So how do you diagnose an exertional heat stroke? The main criterion is a core body temperature greater than 40 degrees Celsius, observed along with physical symptoms, such as increased heart rate, low blood pressure, and rapid breathing, or signs of central nervous system dysfunction, such as confused behavior, aggression, or loss of consciousness. The most feasible and accurate way to assess core body temperature is with a rectal thermometer, as other common temperature taking methods are not accurate in these circumstances. As far as treatment goes, the most important thing to remember is cool first, transport second. Because the human body can withstand a core temperature above 40 degrees Celsius for about 30 minutes before cell damage sets in, it's essential to initiate rapid cooling on site in order to lower it as quickly as possible. After any athletic or protective gear has been removed from the victim, place them in an ice water tub while stirring the water and monitoring vitals continuously. If this is not possible, dousing in ice water and applying wet towels over the entire body can help. But before you start anything, emergency services should be called. As you wait, it's important to keep the victim calm while cooling as much surface area as possible. 
until emergency personnel arrive. If medical staff are available on site, cooling should continue until a core temperature of 38.9 degrees Celsius is reached. The sun is known for giving life, but it can also take life away if we're not careful, even affecting the strongest among us. As Dr. J.J. Levick wrote of exertional heat stroke in 1859, it strikes down its victim with his full armor on. Youth, health, and strength oppose no obstacle to its power. But although this condition is one of the top three leading causes of death in sports, it has been 100% survivable with proper care. So, what's noteworthy about that? What's stuck with you? What's a point that you'll remember after watching that? Yeah? 30 minutes before celebrating. 30 minutes. Okay, exertional heat stroke uh, can typically be survived for 30 minutes before there's more permanent damage. 30 minutes. Good. What else struck a chord? Anything? What did the video talk about? What is exertional heat stroke? Without knowing what heat stroke is, what, are the, what does the exertional part mean? Exercising. Yeah, brought on by exercise. Self-inflicted. Absolutely. So we're talking about the self-inflicted uh, potential damage of hyperthermia. Um, what about some cooling methods? Do you remember any of those? Ice bath. Ice bath. Yeah, absolutely. Do you notice they said um, immerse in ice water while stirring constantly? Why stirring? From our understanding of the heat balance equation. Absolutely. Leverage convection. Heck yeah. We spent some time talking about that last, uh, last week. Um, you might have seen they differentiated compensable from uncompensable heat stress. Compensable being something that it's still self-inflicted, it's exertional. Your body temperature rises, but you can eventually stabilize. Compensable is you can eventually stabilize. You have the... Uh, the ability in place to regulate temperature. Uncompensable is the opposite. You don't have the ability to lose enough heat and your body temperature continues to rise until it reaches very dangerous levels. Did you catch what the dangerous level was approximately? 40? Yeah, over 40. 40, 41, but we still don't have like a, a, an actual number for what the upper limit of tolerance is. I just realized we skipped the end of the last section, didn't we? <laughs> There's some slides at the end of the last section that we didn't talk about. Um, I'll come back to those. 40 is the upper limit. We don't know. Uh, 40 is what we scientifically assign as the upper limit, but we don't know what the, the true temperature is that people can sustain before they die. Some people present with temperatures of 41 degrees with no adverse effects. It's very individual. So one of the three leading causes of death in athletes that is completely preventable. I think those are pretty important points to take out of that video too. It is completely preventable. And this is Doug Cassa, the fellow they talked about at the start of the video. He's a professor at uh, Connecticut, UConn, and head of the Corey Stringer Institute, KSI, that you can see here, who is um, or was a football player with the Minnesota Vikings that died due to exertional heat stress. They were doing um, two-a-day practices and training camp. There's that warrior mentality, never give up. And he collapsed, went to the hospital, didn't wake up. Completely preventable. So he would have exhibited 
or had what uh, would be a fairly extreme form of what we'll broadly call heat illness. Heat illness. A decrease in normal function related to the heat. And it's not just one on or off binary um, disease. This is a spectrum of heat-related disorders starting from, uh, in the most basic sense, heat cramps. One of the first signs of, of heat illness is spastic contractions in the muscle, which can be attributed to heat, but it's hard to discern whether heat is causing the cramps or if it's an electrolyte balance or an issue with uh, fluid loss. Those two things often go hand in hand. You get hotter, you lose more fluid. We're trying to separate them. This section I'm trying to only talk about increases in core temperature. In practice, they always happen together. And one of the first signs of heat illness is this uh, excessive cramping. As cramping progresses and we gain more heat, uh, we're at risk of what we'll call heat syncope. Heat syncope is the uh, cardiac insufficiency. So this is more related to the loss of fluid through sweat, but it is fainting or becoming uh, delirious, fuzzy, unfocused as a result of your body getting too hot. It might be a secondary effect of losing fluid through sweat, but uh, when you start to get dizzy, perhaps faint, fall over, heat syncope is a more severe form of heat illness. But even still, these can be recovered relatively quickly and easily. Still cool, give fluids, stop exercising. Where that advice isn't followed or their symptoms aren't noticed, really the, uh, the three prongs of the, of the trident when it comes to heat illness are shown here. So heat exhaustion is what we call the first diagnosable form of heat illness, where the factors that I'll, I'll, I'll bring on in a second are present, but your temperature is not critical yet. Temperature under 40 degrees is the defining characteristic of heat exhaustion. But the individual typically presents with uh, confusion, some of the elements of syncope that we just discussed, they might faint, their heart rate might be exacerbated. Their skin might be clammy and, and maybe even cool to the touch. But there's no obvious sweating. You've always heard that anecdotally. If you stop sweating, you're in danger. Stop exercising, relax. If it's, if it's hot out and you're, you're trying to exercise. So these other symptoms present without a high core temperature and heat exhaustion. And that's the defining... Um, distinction between heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Heat stroke is where we have those same series of uh, symptoms with a core temperature over 40. So heat stroke would be um, what they recorded, what they observed in Doug Cassis as he was running that race. With perhaps one small variation, heat stroke can encompass passive heat exposure or his exertional heat stroke might be a bit more correct. It was heat stroke brought on by voluntary exercise, provoked by voluntary exercise. So division between these are uh, heat exhaustion and heat stroke can occur passively. If they're brought on by exercise, they would be uh, exertional heat exhaustion, exertional heat stroke. So a somewhat graded response with usually the same suspects as far as symptoms go. But they can be uh, somewhat difficult to diagnose, especially heat stroke is tricky. Um, a lot of these symptoms also present with, with dehydration. Uh, if you can get a, a solid measure of core temperature, you have a better idea. You'd, you'd have a better... Um, uh, success rate of diagnosing heat stroke, but no sweating, confusion, fainting also occurs from simply being dehydrated, which is still a concern, but less, I suppose, of a concern than um, having an elevated core temperature. 
And some athletes will voluntary, uh, voluntarily enter um, this realm, Corey Stringer being one of them. Completely preventable. And so I'm almost left with wondering why, if body heat increases during exercise, and if we continue to push, how does the exercise respond? How does performance respond? At the simplest level, at one large whole body applied level, just looking at the, the time to exhaustion here at a moderate workload of 70% of VO2 max. As temperature goes up, your ability to uh, withstand that temperature and continue to exercise goes down. There's an inverse relationship here where if you're exercising in the heat, for some reason, we don't know what those reasons are yet, your ability to perform is almost cut in half from lower temperatures that might be considered more optimal. And you see the numbers shown here. This is the actual average value, the average time spent exercising, 51 minutes in the heat, compared to 93 and a half minutes at 11 degrees Celsius, which at least from this schematic seems to be the ideal temperature for moderate intensity cycling performance in this case. Heat certainly has a limiting uh, influence on exercise performance. Why? And, and for that matter, why does performance go down even at 21 degrees Celsius? Why is there this progressive decrease in performance as the environmental temperature goes up? That really asks, what are the effects of the environment on our body? Because the environment doesn't make for performance. Our ability to pump blood, our ability to contract the muscles, to send nervous signals, that impacts performance. So what is it about this progressive increase in temperature that affects our physiological response? And in broad categories, we're going to discuss primary thermal effects in this chapter that are the immediate effects of heat as a sensation on uh, neural signal transmission, or force generation, or heart rate, or substrate use. Those can all be acutely affected by being hotter. They're what I'll call primary thermal effects. And we'll contrast this, not in this section, but when we come back uh, next week and talk about dehydration, when we come back and talk about, no, that's not the right one. When we talk about dehydration, secondary effects are related to uh, cardiovascular strain or cardiovascular drift. Heart rate gets progressively higher. Stroke volume gets progressively lower. You lose blood volume because you need to supply the sweating process from somewhere. And that has a secondary uh, role in exacerbating or making worse these primary thermal effects. So we don't know what those are specifically now, but we are exploring them in detail in this section, the primary thermal effects. What's really interesting is that regardless of the environment, regardless of um, external temperature or uh, hypoxia, some other factors, there seems to be a critical temperature where people fatigue. There seems to be a critical temperature. And this is a selection, maybe a cherry-picked selection of, of uh, three studies looking at uh, some different environmental situations with different individuals. And for myself and maybe some of us in the room, we'd be considered moderately fit. And notice the similarity, at least between the two studies where we have data, in core temperatures at fatigue, mid-38s. This is voluntary fatigue, stopping exercise when you can't go anymore. For some reason, there's this consistency between temperatures in moderately fit individuals 
and in more trained individuals and more highly fit individuals. There's agreement across a number of studies that there seems to be some range or some threshold where core temperature becomes critical and fatigue is inevitable. Even if you're well hydrated, even if uh, you try various cooling methods, this persists. If you reach 40.1, 40.2, and you're a highly fit individual, that's a, a critical primary factor indicating fatigue. It's also interesting, not simply that the numbers agree in these vertical columns, but something about training increases that threshold. Something about becoming more fit allows you to withstand a higher core temperature. And that's not specifically acclimation. That's not training in the heat. This is simply physical fitness. Having a higher VO2 max for some reason allows you to withstand a higher core temperature. And I will also point out, to kind of back up the point of what a critical temperature is, in all of these cases, this is voluntary fatigue, and there were no adverse effects reported, even getting as high as 40.3 degrees, no adverse signs of heat exhaustion or heat illness. So that limit seems to be rather variable. We protect ourselves from a scientific point of view when we submit ethics, and we're doing a heat study, we have to say we'll cut the individual off if they reach 39.5 or 40 degrees, depending on how liberal your ethics review board is. But there has to be that ability to monitor and pull the plug if something goes wrong because we know there's a limit. Even though it's variable, we don't ever want to risk someone going over their limit and inducing uh, serious damage. So something about fitness improves that threshold. What are some of the elements that might contribute to fatigue? You have this in your notes, and we're not going to go in depth on each of these boxes. This is vaguely reminiscent of a concept map, which, now that I think about it, might be a good... Um, might be a good subject for your first concept map, which is due next Friday, February 1st. To take this, being your first effort, it might be nice to have framework or scaffolding to take this and add in any new elements that we talk about, add descriptors to these lines so that you have flow as you read through, you can, you can make sentences out of the connections in the flow chart. And I'll ask you as we go through to maybe add a couple points about what we have this, um, this assumption that exercise hyperthermia exists. I'm going to say add a few precursor elements as well to um, describe how this comes about. So let's do that for our first, uh, our first concept map due next Friday. As we go through this section, think about what elements you can add to this flowchart. And I don't want you to take this, print it off, and use it verbatim. I'd like you to recreate this in your own, um, from your own understanding, while including new elements that aren't on here that we talk about, and then uh, an idea of how hyperthermia develops. Ultimately ending at fatigue or exhaustion, but this will be a nice template to use for your first uh, assignment, given that it's practice. We're warming up before doing something more complicated. Sound fair? OK, let's do that. So I think way back when, we briefly alluded to the idea of what fatigue is and that we don't know what fatigue is. There's no one thing that causes fatigue. And so we really have to evaluate fatigue as, as a big picture concept. 
There's many things that contribute to fatigue as shown here, but there are a few different categories at least. And around the top half of this, uh, this flow chart, there are what we'll call central effects. Heat can affect the body centrally. And when I say central, I mean in the brain. Central nervous system versus peripheral nervous system. Central effects of heat. And while I'm not an expert on alpha or beta waves or gamma waves in the brain, apparently those are, are modified, but what we do often observe is at the whole body level, lethargy, fatigue, um, the inability to activate, get up, move around, a decrease in arousal, and an increase in the rating of perceived exertion. You've heard about RPE before. Rating of perceived exertion on the Borg scale, 6 to 20 point scale, or some of them are 0 to 10. And you say, how hard is this exercise? 20 is the hardest you've ever felt in your life. 6 is the easiest it's ever been in your life. And a rating of perceived exertion gives a sense of how hard the exercise feels to the individual apart from the heart rate response or VO2 response, etc. So we have central effects of hyperthermia. There are metabolic effects of hyperthermia as well. We'll talk about this in a bit more detail. This is, this is sort of my wheelhouse. Metabolism. Hypoglycemia. A switch in substrate use by the muscle. Hypoglycemia, one of the, the most closely defended variables in the body. Always have a nice constant supply of blood glucose, usually, because the brain relies on blood glucose. Hypoglycemia is really bad for normal function, let alone exercise performance. This is a key factor in fatigue. And heat accelerates hypoglycemia, accelerates the use of carbohydrate drains the blood of, of sugar, so to speak. So there are metabolic effects of heat as well. What I don't think are on here are the circulatory effects of hyperthermia. So that's sort of a hint of something to look for to add. There is a mention of a decrease in gut blood flow, which is an effect of the circulatory system being compromised. And specifically, that relates to what we call endotoxemia. Does anyone know what that is? Endotoxemia? Endotoxemia is uh, also what we think causes hangovers now, which is interesting. Um, endotoxin is a type of bacteria in your gut, fecal bacteria. And with reduced gut blood flow, in the presence of heat, your intestines become more porous. And so fecal bacteria seeps into the blood, which causes a massive inflammatory response, can affect a bunch of proteins, and eventually contribute to fatigue. Not an expert in this area. I just find it really remarkable that this is, this is also the method that we think hangovers are produced. Leakiness of the intestines. So cardiovascular insufficiency isn't really shown on here. You might put it as a leading, um, a leading factor that contributes to exercise hyperthermia. And I'm... Now that I think about how this is laid out, this might not make a whole lot of sense. This looks like it blocks or reduces exercise hyperthermia. That's not what I want to get across at all. Cardiovascular insufficiency will accentuate exercise hyperthermia. I drew that incorrectly. So knowing, at least if we believe this flowchart, what some of the limiting factors are to performance in the heat, what can we do? Uh, how would we get around central fatigue? Any clues? Uh, 
in your own personal experience or before coming to class? We've not talked about them in this course, so I don't expect you to have an answer, but any ideas of what might help arouse the central nervous system? I can point to at least one person in here that might know. It's actually fewer than I thought would, would uh, show up to class um, with a coffee. Kathy? It's pointing to your, I assume that's coffee. Yeah. So central fatigue largely can be combated by uh, caffeine. Caffeine is a major um, ergogenic aid in improving arousal and decreasing the rating of perceived exertion. Caffeine might be a way to better sustain performance in the heat. If hypoglycemia is a factor, we could take in carbohydrate. Sugar in a sports drink, gels, there's cubes and cliff bars and blocks, a bunch of stuff nowadays. Just make your own sugar water. I do that all the time for hockey. Tastes really bad if you just put sugar in water. You have to mix in like uh, sodium citrate and a bit of citric acid to make it like sweet tarts. It's pretty good. Hypoglycemia though, have some sugar. Um, endotoxins that cause massive inflammation may or may not be offset with ibuprofen or an anti-inflammatory. That could help prolong performance in the heat. Cardiovascular insufficiency, take in fluid. That's the whole underpinning of the idea of the sports drink. Give fluid, give sugar, give some salt, which isn't on here, that helps support those, uh, those pathways, those mechanisms. But I digress, we'll get there eventually. That said, the question then arises, do you want to limit these factors reduce the influence of these factors on fatigue so as to make yourself hotter, to progress further into hyperthermia and perhaps have those negative consequences that we talked about already today. I'm not sure. You really have to weigh your options. Um, let's take a quick five minute break. This is a natural break point before we talk about the, the physiological thermal signals. We will reconvene at, say, 10.35, and I guess I should probably go through the slides we, we missed at the end of last chapter. We'll do that quickly, at the risk of uh, undermining the momentum we've gained this morning. So let's call it for, uh, for now. Let's take a little break, walk around, do jumping jacks, get a coffee, and uh, back in five.